Okay. So, hey, thank you. Um, I appreciate you know, the, the opportunity to be here. Um, thank you, boss, for the, the uh, introduction. And the last name is pronounced, ready? Repeat after me, Vaughn Oppen. Okay, very easy. So, um, thanks for running that through your head once last night. I appreciate it. Um, I was listening, but thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I think we've been trying to put this together for to come to this this fire school for a couple of years now, and my mind has been blown by what you you all have here. It's amazing. I, there's nothing like this in the state of California, and we were talking about it last night. Um, you know, this should be a model for what a lot of the country tries to do in terms of you know, creating a, an environment where there's you know, ample opportunity for training, places to stay. Um, it's, it's amazing. So um, you know, I, I hope you all understand what you have here. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And I'm humbled by the opportunity to come here. And um, you know, a lot of what we're talking about today is going to be about increasing communication, increasing trust, because our most important assets in our organizations are our people. Right? And, and anymore, aren't people becoming somewhat secondary, kind of a little bit of an afterthought in terms of like what's going on in society? You know, it's, it's all about your phone. It's all about, you know, right now it's about barriers, and hopefully we're coming out of that. But, you know, the most important thing that we have going in the fire service are our people, the people who get on their trucks every single day and go out and deliver outstanding customer service. And whether you're paid, you know, you work for a, a paid municipal department or a volunteer department, doesn't matter where you come from, we should all be proud of the size of our department and, and measure our people by the size of their hearts and the size of their effort. And make sure that people don't become part of the landscape. Okay? Don't forget what's most important. Okay? I know I'm talking to some very motivated people here. I was awed by the collective brain power um, that I was surrounded by last night. We had like a meet and greet thing last night, and clearly I was the dumbest person out there. But People are asking me all kinds of questions and stuff like that. It was a nice opportunity to get to know people. But um, I'm just a fire captain from Northern California who I'm going to share some things. Um, please don't hold the fact that I'm a Californian against me. Wow, that was like a low level like murmur of a laugh. I'm like, wow, OK. So that's like a legit thing. You guys don't like Californians here? <laughs> is this plexiglass? Is there an, op is there an open carry law here in <laughs> Carolina? Anyway, um, so South Carolina. So, um, shoot, I don't know what I was saying. But um, I, I put my boots on every single day, just like all of you do. And I try to figure it out every single day. What I'm going to share with you today are some of the experiences that I've had. These aren't necessarily opinions. I mean, they, they might have been opinions early on. But after 24 years of trying to live my career and my life a certain way in the fire service, these are my experiences. And I'm going to share them with you. And not all of them are super, you know, they're not super flattering. You know, I don't paint myself in, in, in a, I, I'm a, trying to paint myself in a very human light, right? Where, like I said, I'm trying to figure it out. I don't take myself too seriously. And you're going to learn a lot about me and some of the mistakes that I've made throughout my career. So any questions about where we're going today? Cool. Very Southern crowd, thank you. That was the participation part, OK? So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is, you know, celebrating this, celebrating, you know, people who love the job. And I'm talking to a room full of people who are very passionate, right, who love the job. You're here. You're very involved at the state level, very involved in your departments. There's a lot of, you know, energy and good stuff going on here at this fire school, okay? But what we're trying to capture is making sure that we don't lose this, right? When we've got people that show initiative, that are going out and training on their own and they're excited about it, you know, we want to maintain that passion in our people. And how do we do that? By showing genuine interest, by creating open channels of communication, by creating trust. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Give you guys a tool for your toolbox to increase trust, increase communication, things like that. So um, there's the cover slide. Boom. OK. We'll start with the video, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about it. That's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck 
on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's not enough left to do, is it? Y'all ready for it? What do you want first? Good news? Nobody wants the good news first. Everybody wants the good news followed by the bad news, right? So we'll go good news first. Good news is, um, unless we feel completely helpless and unless we're completely inept, we can do something about that escalator situation, right? But if we're sitting around in our organizations complaining about the lack of leadership, right, are we going to be waiting a really long time for that one person to show up and, and show us the way? Yeah, we talked about it. I was talking to somebody, a gentleman earlier this morning about motivating their people, right? How do you do that? Is motivation something, can we motivate people to do a better job necessarily, or is that our job as leaders in the fire service? Is it our job to motivate people? Okay, better way of saying that, should motivation be intrinsic? Should our motivation to do our job come from us? Is excellence our responsibility? Yeah, our job as leaders in the fire service is to give the people the tools to be successful and make sure that they don't become unmotivated. Does that make more sense? Okay. You can't, no matter how much you want something for somebody else, and the root of some of my problems when I was coming up in the fire service, I had this unbridled passion for the fire service. I loved my job, and I wanted everybody to love it as much as I did, to the point where I wanted to strangle people. Why don't you love this job as much as I do? Anybody else ever feel that way? Yeah. What does that do to your people, your internal customers? What does that do to them when you come at them like that? Puts you in a bad light, okay? Too much passion, too excited. You know, I can't take him. <laughs> Push him out, right? Okay? So we have to adjust our message, right? Give people the tools, get to know them on a personal level, right? Know our people, what they're capable of down to the cellular level, right? Give them the tools to be successful. And through that, through the trust and through the communication and providing the tools for them, that's where the motivation will be sustained, right? Okay, it's tough, it's tough to motivate other people. You can't make people want it, okay? But we all come into the fire service with a certain passion, certain want to help people. We gotta make sure that we maintain that fire and make sure that people don't lose it, okay? So, bad news is, nobody's coming, okay? Good news is, we can do something about it. And I'm talking to the game changers in the fire service right now in the state of, you know, uh, Texas. Kidding. <laughs> I know where I am. I'm in South Carolina. I'm kidding. So, okay. All right. Good news, bad news. Okay. Um, one of the key themes in this class today is the fact that um, I expect, you know, to your participation, right? And a key theme today also is setting forth expectations. Can we hold people to a standard that we've never established? No, right? But isn't that kind of something that we have a problem with in the fire service is, you know, setting forth expectations, holding people to a standard? Communicating those standards, right? Um, I know that that's what this fire school is all about, is setting standards for the whole state and sometimes the whole region. I mean, there's people that come from all over the world to train here. It's pretty cool. I got a tour of the site yesterday. I was, my mind was, I mean, it's blown. So a key theme today is setting forth expectations. And my expectation of, as an instructor today and people who are instructors in here as well, I expect your participation, okay? So if I throw a question out there, I feed off the energy in the room and caffeine, but I need your help today to make this thing go, okay? Because I learn something new every place I go. I'm, I'm amazed by the amazing people that I meet. Uh, be proud of where you come from. Be proud of what you do and have something to say. So can I get you to help me out today? Okay, that wasn't bad. We'll warm up, okay? So thank you. Um, you know, we didn't go too much into my background, but you know, in terms of being a firefighter, um, I've been in the fire service for 24 years. Uh, I work for a small department in Northern California, City of Palo Alto Fire Department, and over the course of the 24 years that I've been there, we've gone through a lot of changes. Um, much like you know, everybody else across the country, we've downsized, we've gotten smaller, we're running twice as many calls as we did when I got hired with you know, probably a third less people. We've eliminated three engine companies. We used to have seven engine companies, now we have three, eliminated our rescue company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're doing more with less. 
And does that take a toll on your people when you're constantly asked to do more and more and more, but the resources aren't there? And what can happen to our motivation when we start to lose the way that we used to do things? Can morale kind of start to go in the dumper? Uh, yeah. So that's, that's one of the things that's, that's been a difficult transition for us is we've gone through a lot of changes in our department over the last, certainly the last 10 years, okay? But the one thing that keeps me motivated and keeps me coming back and keeps me you know, wanting to do a good job is the fact that I'm surrounded by some amazing brothers and sisters who motivate me to be better. And I want to do well by them and make sure that I'm giving them the best chance to be successful. And as I'm tra transitioning you know, out of my career, I mean, I just turned 50, Thank you, thanks. Um, but I can, I can retire. I don't want to, but it's there. And um, you know, now I feel like my job is to make sure that we're giving everybody the tools to be successful, putting people in a, in a place where they can succeed, right? Because as we go along in our career, isn't our job really to kind of make sure that it's still magic for the new people coming in, like it was for us on our first day, right? Or when we first got hired? You know, create that illusion that there still is a Santa Claus, that there still is an Easter Bunny, right? Okay, and, and make sure that we don't squash people's dreams, okay? Today's class is gonna be great, I know, because uh, I was mentioned in the invocation. That's the first time I've ever been like part of a prayer in the morning, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be awesome today. So anyway, um, but you know, I started in the fire service, um, you know, a long time ago, and, and I tested um, all up and down uh, the state of California as I was trying to get into the fire service. And um, when I finally got my job, I felt like I'd been struck by lightning. I tested for five years, started testing in 1993, got hired in 1998, you know, started as a cadet before that. So um, uh, it, was, it was quite a process. And what really molded and shaped my belief system was I was the son of a football coach. And how many people know what an army brat is? Anybody? Military brat? Hey, what's military brat, brother? Army? Raised, raised by a hard ass. Raised by a hard ass. <laughs> okay, yeah, true. What else? What's true of people that are in military families? Move, Move around a lot, right? Yeah. So much like the military brat, yes, did you have a point? Well, raised under a lot of expectations. Raised under a lot of expectations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. They, 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 work, they live and grow up in houses where there's more discipline, there's a lot of expectations put on them sometimes. Absolutely, well, and they move around a lot, right? So there's a lot of things, that, a lot of pressures and things that are sometimes put on military families, right? So having to move, do all that stuff. Uh, much like the military brat, I was raised the son of a football coach. And as being the son of a football coach, um, much like the military brat, we moved around a lot. I was raised in a household where there were a lot of expectations. There were a lot of expectations on us as a family. There, were a lot of, there was a lot of pressure put on my dad as a football coach because what happens as a football coach um, if, say, you're at the major college level, right, um, and you don't win enough football games, what happens? You get fired, right? You can get fired, right? So I grew up in a true meritocracy, seeing what, like, you know, there were, there were real consequences for not performing. We had expectations put upon us. And I was born in Virginia, moved to Oregon, moved to California, moved to Wisconsin, moved to Arkansas, and back to California, all by the time I was in the fifth grade. Okay? And that's why I have this marked need for attention, right? And that's why going around the country and speaking to people like y'all, it, it works for me, and I, I just bask in this. But anyway, uh, Point is, we moved around a lot, not necessarily because you know, my dad was meteorically ascending the ranks you know, of, of you know, the coaching ranks, but sometimes because he had to take jobs that, that weren't great jobs, and they got fired, and so we moved around. But you know, we, he moved up um, pretty quickly within the coaching ranks. He started off as a high school coach, graduate assistant, unpaid graduate assistant at the University of Arkansas, but his first major college coaching job was at um, UCLA in 1970, and on that coaching staff was Tommy Prothero, Bob, Bob McKittrick, Dick Vermeil. Anybody heard of Dick Vermeil? Won a Super Bowl with the, uh, he's the guy who cries every time he talks about how great his team is, all that stuff. But very emotionally, very invested in his team. But uh, won a Super Bowl with the, uh, the uh, St. Louis Rams at the time. But um, 
Dick Vermeil, George Siefert was on that staff. And um, in that same athletic department, there was another gentleman who worked there at the time who coached on the basketball team. You know who he is? You know who I'm talking about? John Wooden, okay? So when my dad was a young, impressionable position coach working his way up you know, through the coaching ranks, he would sometimes walk down to Coach Wooden's office and knock on his door and say, hey, Coach Wooden, can I pick your brain? You know, can I, can I talk to you about how you set your practices up, how you coach your guys up? I mean, Coach Wooden was so fastidious in the way that he ran his team, he actually even instructed his players on how to put their socks on and lace their shoes up so they wouldn't get blisters during the game. That's how obsessed with the details he was. But no detail was too small, no time was wasted. So he was a student of, of you know, John Wooden's way of doing things for a long time. And up until Coach Wooden passed away, they were friends and they kept in touch. How important are mentors in what we do? Extremely, right? Where are some of the best places that we learn besides the classroom? Where's the one place that we learn probably the most? Fit to table, right? You know, we have institutional memory where we learn and grow as a group by the stories that we tell. So more than being a fire service professional, who I am and what molded and shaped me is that I'm the son of a football coach. That's what really shaped my belief system. And I believe that sports are a metaphor for life. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today uh, as we make this journey is going to be rooted in sports. I'll make the leap into the fire service and all that stuff. But um, so this picture here is a picture of the coaching staff from Stanford University from 1977. That's when my dad began his coaching relationship with Bill Walsh. And if any of y'all have heard about Bill Walsh, um, he was a pretty successful coach for the San Francisco 49ers in the 80s, um, and they won a couple Super Bowls when he was coaching there. So um, that's when he began his coaching relationship with Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh is the one kneeling here in the center in that picture with the white hair. Uh, upper right-hand corner, that's Dennis Green, another one of my dad's friends and contemporaries, coached in the NFL for a long time. Far, George, next to him is George Seifert, and on the far left, that's my dad, Fred Von Oppen. So part of Bill Walsh's coaching tree, um, and again, growing up in that household, I saw some things, and I was privy to some things that, you know, all of us are firefighters in the room here, right? Some capacity, right? Or work for the fire service in some capacity, right? How many of you have kids? Okay. How many of you that have kids that go to the fire station on a regular basis how many of them, as they get older, are over the fact that you're a firefighter? Right? Yeah. OK. So it's like, want to go to the firehouse and climb all over the trucks? No, nah, I'm already did it. I'm over it. You know, I want to play. I want to get on my TikTok, right? Snapchat, all that stuff, right? Wear the funny hats. Nope. So I thought, in much the same way, I thought everybody's dad was a football coach. I thought everybody moved every two years on average. And I thought that everybody just hung out in the locker room. That was like my thing. And when I was, when I was uh, in the fifth grade, for the second time, when I was in the fifth grade, um, <laughs> my dad worked at Stanford again, and, and uh, the, the quarterback there when, you know, uh, was John Elway. And you know, people thought it was so cool that I met John Elway, and he was just some pipply-faced kid who was a Heisman Trophy candidate. I didn't care. Like, hey, what's up? You know, so um, grew up seeing what a true meritocracy looked like. Starting in 1984, I started going to training camp with my dad when he started working for the San Francisco 49ers. I would go to training camp every year from the time that I was in sixth grade through my junior year in high school. I would live in a little tiny dorm room with my dad, work two-a-day practices, attend team meetings, um, and those practices were scripted and choreographed down to the minute. And I saw what greatness looked like. I saw what great coaching looked like. I saw what true competition looked like, what a true meritocracy looked like, where if you weren't the best four or five players or one or two players in your position group, what happens? Yeah, you're looking for another job, right? So unbeknownst to me, I was witness to some pretty cool things. And like I said, I didn't even understand what I was seeing. I just thought everybody's dad was a football coach, and I thought everybody you know, went, to the, went to football games on Saturdays and Sundays, and I, that was just how it was, okay? But it was kind of a special and unique way to grow up. So when I finally decided that I wanted to go into the fire service and follow my grandfather's footsteps. My dad's dad was a fire captain for Eugene Fire Rescue in Oregon. So when I was growing up, you know, up until the age of five, we would go to the firehouse and I'd get to climb all over the trucks and do all that stuff. And there's a picture of me wearing my plaid shorts and a turtleneck and, um, and, a, and a, a Johnny and Roy cap, emergency 51, standing on the, on the tailboard of my, my grandfather's, you know, ladder truck, okay? It's pretty cool. So 
When I finally decided that I wanted to go down that route, right, and started testing, moved back to California, started testing, going to fire school, doing all that stuff, put myself through a pre-service academy, working as an EMT, did that for five years. And I tested all up and down the state of California. I went to Oregon, Washington, I went to Nevada, I went as far away as Dallas, Texas, and I was gonna go wherever the job was. When I finally got hired by the Palo Fire Department, after testing for five years, sometimes going, to, you know, going down to LA and taking tests where there were 3,000 people that took the test, Growing up the way that I grew up, seeing the things that I saw, did I have this unreasonable expectation that once I made it, that everybody in the fire service was a superstar? Think about how long it took me to get my job, five years. And I told you, I did the fifth grade twice, and I'm not the smartest, <laughs> smartest person in the room, right? So well, we could talk about that at a break or at lunchtime about me doing fifth grade twice. But did I have this unreasonable expectation that everybody was a superstar in the fire service, growing up the way that I grew up, seeing the true meritocracy, seeing what it took to be great, being you know, where my dad was a part of two world championship teams. I worked on a, as a ball boy on those world championship teams, working on the sidelines during games, attending team meetings, all that stuff. Did I have this unreasonable expectation that everybody shared the same motivations? Does everybody share the same motivations? No. And my first introduction to mediocrity in the fire service, went like this. Okay, I'm super excited. I got hired by you know, the Palo Alto Fire Department, and we're going to a joint fire academy, and they, they do a regional fire academy, and everybody pools their resources, and they hosted it at, at a certain agency. It was being hosted by the Santa Clara City Fire Department, and I was so excited to be there. And it's a great academy. Don't get me wrong. The Santa Clara County Joint Fire Academy is a great academy, and it turns out some great firefighters. Um, I skated through. I got through there. I came in last in my academy class. Anyway, how am I doing as far as like credentialing myself? Am I doing okay? There? <laughs> Fifth grade twice, last in my academy class. 93% was last in my academy class, so relax. All right. Um, but um, my first introduction to mediocrity in the fire service occurred during the academy. But prior to that, I was a fan of backdraft. How many of y'all like were a big fan of backdraft when I came out, right? Okay, I'm dating myself. I've actually done this talk and had people be like, what's backdraft? I'm like, oh my. <laughs> Please leave, right? So, um, you know, and we go to academy orientation night, and all the chiefs are there in their class A uniforms and scrambled eggs on their hats and all that stuff, and, and, and I'm all dressed up and looking the part, and I'm with my girlfriend and my wife, or not my wife, my, that'd be weird. <laughs> my girlfriend, who would later become my wife, but, um, and my mom, she's there too, and, and as we're sitting there and they're talking about the commitment and all the things that we're going to have to do and, and how, what a you know, trying career it is, but what a noble calling it is, they're showing clips of backdraft as we're, as we're watching this. And they're showing that clip where you know, Bull is mortally injured in the, in the hazardous materials facility and the fire's blowing, you know, blowing up around him. And, and here comes Brian to save him, right? And, and he's like, oh, look at him. That's my brother, you know, that whole thing. And like my mom's crying, my girlfriend's crying, oh, that's my wife, right? Ooh, all this stuff, you're so brave, it's so wonderful. I'm like, yeah! <laughs> That's what it's gonna be like, right? So, I get through the academy, and like I said, I come in last in my academy class. Um, but prior to that too, I'm in the academy, and how much do we look up to people in leadership positions like when you're at the fire school? And when someone walks in the room to teach, is that, is that should we give them our, our full attention and respect and everything? Yeah. Is it up to that person, too, to live up to the standards that, that you know, the students have for them, the expectations that they have, right? Well, our expectation was that we were supposed to be there early, we were supposed to be in full uniform, gig line straight, tie on, all that stuff, boots shined, all that stuff, pants creased, uh, so sharp that you can cut your fingers on them, right, that whole thing. And so when the instructor walks in, we're supposed to be there early, one, and then two, when the instructor walks in, right at eight o'clock, we're supposed to spring to attention and be ready to you know, learn. Right, be completely plugged in, eyes and ears, that whole thing. And uh, one day, this this guy comes walking in to our academy class. And I told you we run a pretty tight academy where if you don't if you don't perform at any point, you can be fired. And I told you how long it took me to get my job, right? So we walk in and we spring to attention like we're supposed to. First of all, the guy showed up 15 minutes late, which should have been a, a signal for us that something was up. But they were all class always started at right at eight o'clock in the morning, right? So he shows up 15 minutes late. And um, as we spring to attention, after sitting there for 15 minutes waiting for him to come in, sitting at attention, 
He walks in, and the, the, the way that he walked in, he just walks in kind of disheveled, hair's kind of sticking up, looks like he hasn't shaved in four or five days, uh, uniform shirt, and he had, he had captain's bugles on. His uniform shirt, they wore white shirts, but it was kind of rumpled up, looked like he had maybe pulled it out of the you know, hamper, tried to shake the wrinkles out of it, half untucked, day boots unzipped, and pants tucked into his duty boots, and he comes walking in, and he goes, hey, you guys at ease or whatever. Uh, so we sit down. He goes, hey, I hate to break it to you, but the guy that's supposed to teach your class today called in sick at the last minute, so they called us up, and we're here today. Um, obviously didn't want to be there, right? And he goes, what are you guys working on? And then I, I raise my hand, ladder, sir, we're working on ladders. He goes, okay, well, since I don't have a game plan for you and this just got dropped on me, we're going to go around the classroom and we're going to read the ladder chapter aloud one paragraph at a time until we get our act together here. You guys good at that? We're like, it's a joke, right? Okay. Um, I mean, other than the fact that he looked like he'd been sleep sleeping in his car, did he miss an opportunity to lead? Yeah. Is it all about appearances? Not necessarily, right? I mean, even if he looked like that, I mean, yeah, it would, it would be nice if you'd you know, run a sharp rock over your face, tuck your shirt in, zip your boots up, right? Come walking in. But if he just walked in and owned it and came in and said, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for standing at attention. I appreciate it. My name is Mark Von Oppen. Uh, we apologize for being late here today. We had a little bit of a staffing issue. The person who was supposed to teach your ladder class today had a family emergency and couldn't be here. That's the bad news. Good news is you've got me and my crew here today, and we're excited to teach you ladders, OK? Um, we're going to get a game plan together. I want you all out. Did you read the ladder chapter last night? Yes, sir, I read the ladder chapter. OK, great. So I want you to go outside, be in your full PPE, have your bottles on. We're going to throw ladders a lot, learn a lot, have a good time today. You with me? OK. Sometimes it's all about the way that we sell it, right? We can't miss an opportunity to lead. And we have to tell people that. We have to reinforce that in people as they're coming up in the organization. Right? I'm preaching to the choir right now. I'm, teaching, I'm, I'm preaching to all the leaders in the room, right? But sometimes do we stifle leadership qualities in our, in our young people? You ever heard this one? You know, I don't care how you did it over there, or you don't have an opinion until you've been here for 10 years and stuff like that. Right? OK. I mean, I know we talk a lot about lead, 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 lead. We want these leaders. But yes, you do have to be a good follower. You have to know when to step up, know when to lead. But we also have to have those communication, those talks, and that communication with our people to find out what they're good at. Okay, so I make it to the academy. Like I said, come in last, and I was pretty nervous when I went to the academy. Right, you know, they told us that we were going to get fired if we screwed anything up or anything like that. And and so, if you thought I was nervous during the academy, which I was, because uh, I didn't want to screw things up, but how nervous do you think and excited do you think I was for my first day on the floor? You guys remember that one? OK. What time is shift change for most of the departments around here? 7? Oh, 7.45? OK, what time is the rookie, if it's 7.45, what time is the new firefighter supposed to be there before shift, or the first day, or the first year? 6.30? Atta baby, OK. Hour and 15 minutes early? Sound about right? And what happens if you're not there an hour early? Are you late or are you something else? You might be like something considered an A asset, right? You might be considered something else, right? If you're late, OK? So and when the rookie shows up for their first day, are they supposed to show up just empty handed? Can they show up just like and say, hey, I'm here, teach me everything? Or do they have to, do they have to do something too? Do they have to bring donuts, OK? And what's like the local convenience store around here? What's like a? Circle K? OK. I was going to say, there's the one. What is it Wawa? That's up north, isn't it? Yeah. QT? OK. Can I, if I, if I got to bring in donuts on my first day and I got to be there an hour early, can I just show up at the QT or whatever or, or the quick stop or something like that? Can I just pick up Hostess Donuts? Is that going to suffice? Throw those on the table? No, I better show up with some donuts from the bakery, right? I better have the right ones. Okay, and I better show up with a lot of them. Okay, so I'm super nervous. We're supposed to show up at least an hour before shift, be in full uniform, have donuts, all that stuff, and be ready to go. So I live 25 miles from the fire station that I was assigned to, so I, sh I left an hour and a half early, right, to get there to make sure I was there on time. I stopped by the donut shop, and I got two dozen donuts for six people at shift change. 
right? And I got the two big pink boxes, and I was ready to roll. And at, at, at 6.30 in the morning, I'm level one stage in the direction of travel, one block away from the fire station I was first assigned to, right? And I'm sitting there, and I'm fogging up the windows in my Jeep, because I have this nervous talking thing. I don't know if you can tell, but I talk really fast. And I, I, <laughs> I start doing that. I start asking questions and saying dumb things, and I get nervous. More on that later. But I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm giving myself a pep talk. Okay, don't do the nervous talking thing. Make sure you're there on time. Okay, what time do I really need to be there? Okay, all these things are rolling through my mind. So I'm trying to figure out what time I want to get there, because I don't want to be there too early, and I don't want to be there too late. I want to get there right at 7 o'clock. So at 6.58, like I said, I'm only like a block away. I turn the motor over and I hit the defroster in my little tiny Jeep Wrangler that I had, which the defroster was a towel that I kept on the seat next to me because I was too, <laughs> too broke to fix the defroster. Turn the motor over, defroster went on, I proceed into the scene. And as I proceed into the scene and arrive at fire station three, I'm doing my parking lot size up. And why do I have to size up the parking lot? There's a parking spot that's right next to the fire station that's open. That might be the captain's parking spot. I can't take that one. There's one in the middle. That might be the senior, you know, senior firefighter spot. I can't take that. There's one, and there's, there's a couple more. There's one all the way to the end. I'm going to take that one. That one's safe, right? So I kill the motor, and I coast in in neutral, real quiet like, because I don't want to wake everybody up, because he might have been up all night on engine three. All right? <laughs> so proceed. Now I'm hyperventilating again, because I don't know what I should bring in first. Do I bring in my turnouts? Or do I bring in the donuts? What, I, what goes first? If I bring my turnouts first, they'll give me crap for not bringing donuts, right? Where are the donuts, rookie? No, no, they're in the car. Oh, the rookie didn't bring donuts, right? And then if I bring my turnouts, you know, that right, the whole thing, right? It, it's, I, can't, I can't win. So I, I decide that I'm going to carry both at the same time. And um, I'm trying to carry two big pink boxes of donuts in one hand and horse my turnouts in the other. And I get to the back door. I'm dropping stuff. It's a yard sale on the way from my car to the, the back door of the fire station. And I get there, and I'm like, oh, how do I open the door? And luckily, the, the engineer from the offcoming shift was coming out to get a cup of coffee. And he came out, and he said, hey, good morning. Are you Mark? And I said, yeah, thanks. You know, he goes, well, welcome to Fire Station 3. What do you got there? I go, I got two dozen donuts. He's like, right on, dude. Throw them on the table. So we threw them on the table. And he took me, and he said, hey, let's get your gear on the rig and get you situated so you're ready to go. If we get a call. I'm like, OK. So a little, you know, he kind of took me under his wing a little bit, and, and I felt pretty good about, you know, he goes, do you know where you sit? And I said, yeah, I sit behind the captain on the driver's side, or on the passenger side. And he goes, okay, great. And so as we're, you know, walking through the station, you know, the smells hit you, and every station has, like, a different smell to it, you know. You can smell the coffee, you can smell the diesel, you can smell the hose, you can smell the tire, all this stuff, right? And, um, and I'm starting to think about, and this, this fantasy began, you know, way before this, but in the fire academy, really thinking about what it was going to be like when I met my first leader in the fire service, that first captain that I worked for, that first company officer. What is that moment supposed to be like when you meet your first company officer? Yeah. I had it built up as this, you know, like, biblical type of event where it was going to be like, you know, like, the clouds are going to part, the angels are going to sing, the light was going to shine down, and my captain's going to have this aura around him. Kind of, you know, like, it, it was just going to be like, oh, like to just this, I was going to have this epiphany. It was just going to be amazing, right? So anyway, I, I go back to the rig, and, and I snap back to reality, and, and the guy goes, okay, this is where you sit. Here's your, here's your BA. You know, we had these open cab Pierce arrows back in the day, and I'm here to tell you that being a 26-year-old firefighter riding backwards in an open cab in California, woo, it doesn't get any better than that. As a young 26-year-old dude, it was like, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Right? It's like that. <laughs> Throwing my phone around. Um, but um, where's it going with that? So he says, check out your mask, check out all your stuff. And so, like I said, I, I'm building this up in my mind for what it's going to be like when I meet my first company officer. And that, that moment's about ready to arrive. And check out the rig. And I'm making sure that I'm checking out the rig and, and making a lot of noise as I'm doing so so that people know that I'm out there working. And, and hopefully, someone will come out and talk to me. And nobody did. Um, so I walk into the, the kitchen after checking out the rig. And, and I say to the guy, you know, people are starting to arrive now. And there's you know, a bit of an audience. And I say to the guy that, that uh, you know, showed me the rig, I said, hey, I'm done checking out the rig. I feel pretty good about where everything is. And he said, oh, do you? And as soon as I said it, I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> He goes, hey, the rookie says he knows where everything on the rig is. I'm like, oh, my god, no, right? And he goes, I'm just kidding, kid. Don't, uh, 
Don't ever say that again, though, because you're going to get yourself in trouble. Don't talk. I'm like, OK. So, so he goes, uh, he goes I'm gonna, let me introduce you to the next most important piece of equipment in the, in the fire station. Fire engine, right? That's the first most important piece of equipment in that house. What's the next post, most important piece of equipment? Absolutely, right? Coffee pot. Hey, kid, here's a coffee pot. Do you drink coffee? No, I don't. What the hell's the matter with you? That was the first next question I got. I'm like, do you know how to make coffee? Forget it. You don't even drink it. Here we go, kid. We're going to have a lesson on this, right? See this? This is the carafe. Pull that out. See that syrup in there? Dump that stuff out. Rinse it out. Fill it up to 14. Open it up. Put water in the reservoir, OK? Pull out the gold cone filter, kid. Dump the, dump, dump the spent grounds out. I want you to fill this thing up to the top. I want it overflowing. Pack it down. Throw it in there. Hit bold. Hit start. You know, hit brew, whatever it is. We like it strong. We like it thick. We like it going all day long. I'm like, OK, I'm writing all this stuff down. And then I got taken to the next. I had a little steno pad that I had. And then I got taken to the next most important place in the fire station for the rookie firefighter. And what's that? Cleaning closet, right? Yeah. Got time to lean. You got time to clean, right? You know, I could clean porcelain until it glistened like snow by the end of my probation, but I didn't know which end of the hose the water came out of, really. But, but you know, there's your broom. There's your mop. There's your comet. There's your toilet brush. There's your gloves. Hey, kid, little tip for you. If you make blue water in the toilet, they'll think you cleaned the toilet even if you didn't. And I wrote that down. And I was sure that there was some sort of a test that they were going to perform, like there was a hidden camera or something like that where they were going to get me. But I made sure that I cleaned the toilet anyway. So he goes, hey, get to it. Stay busy. You'll stay out of trouble. I'm like, OK. So I start dust mopping the floors. And I'm dust mopping the station. And I'm, I'm at the far end of the station when at about um, you know, 7.58 or something like that, shift changes at 8 o'clock. And remember. I got to be there at, at like 7 in the morning, or I'm labeled as a problem child, right? With donuts in full uniform, right? Ready to go. Okay, but everybody else rolls in in board shorts and flip flops because we surf to work in California. <laughs> when I went to college in Montana, people actually asked me that question Do you surf to work? I'm like, Do you ride a horse to work? No, I, I mean, <laughs> you know, or surf to school. That was what the question was. But anyway, um, 7.58, I hear a car come screeching to the back parking lot. And as I recall it, the car goes screeching to the back parking lot. And Starsky and Hutch style slides, power slides backwards, facing out into that first parking spot right by the fire station. And it was cool because, you know, firefighters are the same wherever you go. And when I went to the, the offices for um, the, the State Firefighters Association yesterday, you could tell who all the firefighters were by their cars. They were all backed into the parking spots. It was awesome. I'm like, well, I'm right at home, back in. So, um, so, and out climbs my first company officer, right as the bell's about to hit, right? Right as school's about to start. Eight o'clock in the morning, he comes rolling in. And I'm at the far end of the station with my dust mop. And as he breaks the plane of the fire station and comes in and sits down and grabs a cup of coffee and the newspaper and starts reading the newspaper, BSing with the crew that was in there, that dust mop magically propels me back into the kitchen. And I'm, I come into the kitchen, and I start going around the table, right? And I'm dust mopping around the table, and I'm, I'm wearing the floor out. I'm, going, I'm circling that table like, like I'm a shark, right? Going around and around and around. And finally, on my fifth revolution, my captain says to me, he goes, he just says out loud, he goes, geez, kid, quit going around the table so many times. You're making me nervous. So I spring to attention. Sorry, sir, recruit from up and reporting from my first day of duty. What do you want me to do to catch a fire right now? And as soon as I said that, I mean, he almost, coffee almost shot out of his nose. He goes, <laughs> get a load of this guy. All right? A fire right now? Don't worry about it, kid. We'll figure it out when we get there. All right? So I'm standing there. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I've got the dust mop in my hand. I'm like, where's the, oh, where's the, you know, where's the, what just happened? That was underwhelming, right? Did he miss an opportunity to lead? Yeah. Okay, expectations, right? Okay, so I'm making my way through my probation. Our probation's pretty structured. You know, we have tests and all that stuff every month and have a written exam that's 100 questions every month, a, a map test where we had to memorize every street in the city. And every month we have some sort of a manipulative exam where we have to be at the tower and perform. And if we don't perform at a high level, we can get launched, right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm practicing, you know, my, 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 uh, my nozzle work in the toilet, you know, I'm making blue water and I'm, I'm putting the comet in and I got my toilet brush. I'm like, okay, if I'm fighting fire above the equator, I rotate my nozzle in a counterclockwise fashion. 
If I'm below the equator, it's a, it's a clockwise height. Do you guys remember that? Nobody. They just ran that, that, that that's what they told me. You remember that? Thank you. Because you didn't want to push fire on yourself, right? That whole thing, yeah. It's crazy. Okay, you, are you lying to me right now, or did you, okay. Because they used to te teach that. 30 degree fog, I was in, so. So I'm working on it, and, and when I went to my first manipulative exam, um, I did the work of all 18 people that we hurled at a first alarm assignment. When we had a working fire, I had to do the work of all of them. I got evaluated on all 18 positions. Like when we arrived at the tower, they said, fire's on the second floor of the tower. Okay, hit the hydrant, lay a supply line, supply the engine with water, run back to the engine, do a tool drop, you know, uh, pull your line to the front door, force the front door, go in, get water to the line, go inside, do a search, fight the fire, drag the victim out, do CPR on the front lawn, throw a ladder, VES, you know, <laughs> vent the roof, do all that stuff, start the fan, do all that stuff. I had to do all that stuff, right? And there is some validity to teaching people to do every single job on the fire ground. Why? So we can plug them in anywhere, right? But I didn't know where I fit into the equation when we actually had an incident. And so my probation goes along. And as, as I'm working my way through probation and, and trying to figure things out, we had a, you know, a car fire here, structure response there, but we're not burning it down. You know? and, and so, um, you know, like I said, dumpster fire here or something like that. But, so I had some, a little bit of experience, but most of my firefighting experience, again, consisted of what I learned in the academy and then making blue water in the toilet, like I said. So one day we're at the tower, and I'm, it's my third month of probation, and I'm working in District 3, so I had the District 3 map test for um, my third month of probation. So District 3, District 3 map test, and now it's ropes and knots that I'm trying to learn. And I don't know about you, but in California, we have like these things that go up out of the back of our city called mountains, and they're super tall. Santa Cruz Mountains go up out of the back of our station, and so we occasionally get rescues up there. We gotta rappel down and do all that stuff. It's kinda cool. Um, but I can't tie my shoes. So, you know, learning how to do ropes and knots and everything, it's not my thing. So um, we're at the tower and I've got my bunker pants on and I'm trying to tie a hasty seat around my waist and it's not going exceedingly well. And the training captain's standing there looking over me doing this stuff and so, you know, he's, he's looking at me disapprovingly as I'm doing this and, and my captain's radio goes into alarm as we're doing my test. And they start, the dispatch center starts dispatching out a first alarm assignment for a working fire in our first due. It came in as, as North California Avenue, cross of Embarcadero, and I was like, <gasps> I go, that's our first due, I just took that map test. And my captain goes, that's right, get on the rig, we're going to the fire. So I start hustling the rig, get on the, on the rig to go to the fire, and the training captain says, Mr. Von Oppen, come back here, you have a training, uh, you have a test you have to complete, you're not going to the fire. So I'm dejected, right? And I'm like, oh, man, we're not going to the fire, I gotta finish this test, what? And so my captain goes, we're going to the fire, get on the rig. You're not going, we're going, you're not going. So I'm jumping back and forth trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. Finally, my captain goes, get on the rig, we're going to the fire. So I run to the rig as fast as I can, and I'm getting dressed, I got my hood on, and I'm, I got my, my turnout coat on, I'm all buckled up, I'm sitting in the jump seat, and I'm ready to roll. Seatbelt on, you know, headset on. And my captain and the training captain are still arguing, you know, he's got a task, how's he gonna learn that whole thing? And so finally they, they agree to disagree, and my captain comes running to the rig with the engineer, and they're getting dressed, and I decided that I could shave some time off the evolution we get on scene by putting my bottle on. So I'm sitting in a jump seat, bottle on, all ready to go, okay? Then I go, well, they're still not ready, okay, I'll put my mask on. So my mask goes on, hood, headset, no, they're still not ready, Beep. turn on my bottle, click in my MMR, and as we're, as we're leaving the training center going two districts away, I'm masked up and on air on the way to the fire, right? <laughs> So we're on our way and, and you know, you can hear the dispatcher, dispatchers talking like an auctioneer and they're, they're reporting that we're getting multiple calls coming from the street, um, the roll calls going, all that stuff, and I'm <laughs> right? Some of my bottles icing up, I go, okay. <laughs> what do you want me to do when we get there? He says, don't worry about a kid, every fire is in, we'll figure it out when we get there. I'm like, uh, okay, cool. So, you know, we're, we're driving, and I'm, I'm probably at half a cylinder to arrive on scene. And maxi brake hits, and I jump off the rig, I'm ready to go. And all I see as I jump off the rig is the back of my company officer's turnout coat as he's heading down the Bravo side of the structure, doing what, probably? Taking the only portable radio that we had at the time. What's he probably doing if he's trying to set the incident up for success? He was 360 walk around, right? 
we're going to do this. Second new engine, do that. Third new engine, do this. Da, da, all these things, right? So he's trying to set the incident up for success. But what was the one variable he left out of the equation? Yeah, 26-year-old rookie firefighter and backdraft fan who is now hypoxic, Mark Von Oppen. <laughs> right? Okay. I'm ready to roll. How well do you think I'm going to hold fast on the front lawn when the lady that lives in the house comes sprinting out the front door and says, I know where the fire is, I'll show you. Because we arrived on scene, we had smoke showing, smoke curling out of the eaves, it was two-story residential, right? And it was pumping out the eaves, and I'm like, oh man, it's on. So do you think I'm going to sit there and say, just one moment, ma'am, my company officer is completing his 360 walk around, at which point we will formulate a plan, go in, put your fire out, because every fire is different. Do you think I'm going to say that? Nope. I'm going to say, I'm going to look at the house, and I'm going to look at the rig, and she's got me by my collar, save my house. I'm going to grab the closest line I can see, right, throw it over my shoulder, and as I do so, I'm throwing the, the task force tip over my shoulder. I think I almost knocked the lady unconscious because I think it hit her in the face. Karate chop, pull the line, and I'm sprinting towards the front door as she's pulling me to the front door. She's yanking me upstairs. She goes, the fire's in the attic. I go, okay. And it starts, smoke's starting to bake down on the second floor. She goes, that's how you get in the attic. I'm tripping over the hose, all that stuff. And I go, it's getting really dangerous. Get out of here. Boom. And I kick her down the stairs, and she tumbles down the stairs. I made that up. But get out of here, ma'am. It's really dangerous. I go to the window. I call for water. Send the water, Dave. And my, my bell's now going off. I, <laughs> and I'm like. I, I pull down the attic access, right? Smoke's starting to bake down on the second floor. I pull down the attic access, right? I didn't clear the second floor to make sure that I didn't have fire that was in a bedroom or something extending into the attic, right? Or that there was a, maybe there was a fire in the basement extending you know, through balloon front and smoke coming out, right? Because we've been to those, right? So I pull down the attic access, and as I do so, the fire started talking to me. Smoke goes <sighs> into the attic, and I could see the fire start <sighs> Roll across the attic. I'm like, oh, oh my. Whoo. <laughs> right? Bleed the line off, right? Line charges. Dave sends the water. <laughs> line charges. And I bleed the line off. And I'm knocking pictures off the walls and stuff like that. And I climb into that burning attic all by myself. And I'm bear hugging that inch and three quarter. And I'm up there. And I am doing it. Right? Just doing it. <laughs> Company officer comes around after finishing his 360 lap, setting the incentive for success. Goes, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do, Dave. <laughs> Dave, where's Mark? And Dave just goes. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, oh, my. He starts running inside. He's masking up as fast as he can. He's trying to get navigate coming up the stairs. And there was water like cascading down the stairs and furniture and sheetrock that was now tumbling down the stairs. And he gets up there, and all he can see in the steam and the smoke is, you know, like my knees standing on that ladder. And he pulls on my pant leg. And as my witness, I, he goes, what are you doing? And I go, I look back, and in my best Brian McCaffrey voice, I go, I'm doing it! Right? <laughs> but what was I really doing? What do they call that? OK. Right? Does anybody know Alan Brunacini, which I said in the Alan Brunacini room, Brunacini room last night here at, on the campus, it was awesome. Anybody know what Alan Brunacini says about firefighters and freelancing? What does he say about firefighters and freelancing? You don't know? Okay. He's very wordy, a uh, very wise man. He says, firefighters can often freelance themselves into a considerable amount of trouble, but rarely do they possess the skill set to extricate themselves from the trouble that they freelance themselves into. Is that about right? Okay, We knocked the fire down, right? I did a, a tremendous amount of water damage, right? Um, right? But what should have happened as soon as that fire was knocked down, as soon as it's safe to do so, what should my company officer have done? What was that? Broke his foot off in my backside. OK. So don't threaten me with a good time, man. <laughs> 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 OK, we have one broke his foot off in my backside. What else we got? Anybody else? Coach me. OK, who said that? OK, what do we mean by that? OK, so we have, and I would have been the same way. I would have said, don't you ever, and if I ever catch you, and you, right? OK? But if we're really being introspective, right, and we're thinking about 
how that whole thing started, think about how that story started. Started in the academy, right? Started with expectations and then coaching. What do you mean by, like, how could he have coached me up? What could he have said? Right. What's that? Probably, yeah, before I went on air and got all hypoxic, right? <sighs> gotten all intoxicated by the fire and the smoke and all that stuff and then gotten caught up in the moment, right? What happens to me as, or what happens to us as organisms when our heart rate and our blood pressure gets up above a certain point? Yeah, what, what happens to our vision? It narrows. What happens to our ability to hear? Goes away, okay, all right? So think about that first interaction that we had, right? I'm at the firehouse, I'm excited, I asked the question. Hey, Cap, what do you want me to do if we catch a fire right now, okay? I am the third, I'm riding third on an in-service engine company, staffed with three. Do I need to be a functional team member immediately? Right, I'm getting tested in a month on hose and ladders and SCBA and all that stuff. And as I went through that process, think about what I told you then. I did the work of all 18 people the first alarm assignment, okay? How much different would that fire have been if I had showed up that first day and my captain may have snickered and said, hey kid, I appreciate your enthusiasm, right? But in the unlikely event that we catch a fire right this second, here's what I expect from you. Get on the rig if the word smoke or fire are in the dispatch, have all your PPE on, including your SCBA. Don't mask up one before we leave the station. <laughs> have all that on, including your SCBA, have a tool in your hand, be ready to pull this line, meet me at the front door, and don't do anything else until I tell you. If something changes, I'll let you know. How long did that talk take? Yeah, I, talk, I, I do talk fast. Here in South Carolina, that might take five minutes, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. We are so impatient in California. I talk so fast compared to like y'all here. I love it here though. You guys are the sweetest people ever. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, but, is it difficult sometimes for us to have those, even those little conversations, where it's like, oh, hey, here's what I expect from you, because we feel like we're being oppressive or we feel like we're being overbearing. Don't we sometimes feel that way? Okay. The reason why this came you know, in, into my purview and where I really started thinking about it, the further I went was um, when, uh, when I was a new firefighter, um, a year before I got hired, I had gone to Mission Community College with a guy named Brian Jacob Golden. And Brian was, a, was a, a medic, and he tested for the city of Stockton Fire Department. And we went to Mission Community College together in this free service academy. And in 1996, we all went to uh, Stockton, California, and took a test, an entry-level test. It was paramedic preferred, so Brian got picked up. I was in paramedic school. I wasn't a paramedic yet, so I didn't get hired, okay? But I went to school with Brian. I didn't know him super well, but I had classes with him. It took some hands-on stuff with him. I knew who he was. I knew what he looked like. We went up there as a group, right, together. And anybody watch much YouTube fire stuff? How, how does Stockton, California get down? They get, a lot of, they get a lot of work? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming out of Stockton. They, 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 uh, they have a lot of fire. So uh, Brian got hired. I was still testing all that stuff. On Brian's first fire three weeks on the job, they get kicked out on a, on a single family dwelling fire in the middle of the night. And when they arrive on scene in the darkness and in the smoke, the, the house was not sized up adequately. 360 wasn't performed for whatever reason. I think because they said they had a rescue going in so the, the company officer didn't perform a full 360, okay? And it was actually a two story residential. They sized it up as a one story. And Brian and his, his senior firefighter went in together to do a search and you know, primary, primary search and fire control and the second story collapsed on it within minutes of entering the structure, and they were both killed. So is it important that we set forth expectations and tell people what we expect of them so that it eliminates all the ambiguity? Because do people like being told what to do? Okay, but is a better way of saying that? Do people like to know what's expected of them? Absolutely, okay? All right. So in terms of you know, setting forth expectations and that sort of thing, I went probably four years on the job 
before anybody really asked me what I wanted to do or told me what they expected of me, okay? And is that too long, okay? And think about what I was talking about earlier about how important mentors are and, and what that means to us and how we learn and grow as a group by the stories that we tell you know, in the firehouse. Whoop. I'm gonna jump ahead here a little bit. Um, but think about, I want you to watch this video here real quick and think about setting forth expectations and how important those are um, and imagine that you're a new company officer um, who is working with a crew that you've never worked with before and you haven't set forth expectations. Tell me if this is something that can happen. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is a new dimension. A dimension of sound. A dimension of sight. A dimension of mind. You're moving through a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Sector. Ah, boys. Oh, man, I'm going down. I'm tired, man. It's been a long day. Hope we get to sleep on that one. All right, Skip. We're going to wait up for the big one. Yeah, all right. I'll see you guys in the morning. All right. Get late. I've been, I've been calling my baby. So for the younger people that are in the room, that's a telephone. We used to have a station oh, man. line. She's still awake. <clears throat> where we'd make personal phone calls. Hello. Hey. Hey. What you doing, baby? How are you? I'm all right. Good. Where are you at today? Uh, we're down south, man. It's a little oh. different for me, baby. I'm not, you know, I'm normally up north. It sent me down south right. today. Just a little different, but. Right. Guys are good, but, but you know, I hear they're crazy, man. Oh, yeah? Yeah, we haven't had anything yet. We just a couple first day calls, but oh, uh, they're pretty crazy. Hey, uh, enough of them hairy leg fine, <laughs> man. What are you wearing, baby? Well. With the United States on Thursday in a gold medal game. Engine three, engine four, engine 14, engine 15, engine 16, ladder four, ladder one. Red and three, the tiny two. Yeah, the stairs. Three and one is fine. Come on, man, this is the fire. I gotta go. Do not let three be the same. I'm taking it out of here. Where the hell's he at? Come on, Twinkle Toes. Get on the damn truck. We got a fire to go to. Come on, let's go. Get in there. Come on, let's go. Where are you going? Hey, look at this green. What the heck? You got on? Where's your uniform? Get the door. Get in my truck. Fire Captain Francisco Montalban is about to embark on a perilous journey of monumental consequences. An otherwise routine task of saving lives and extinguishing conflagratious infernos is about to become a journey into the virtual unknown, an immense, never-ending wormhole that we call the Twilight Sector. Hey, Cod, man, you're driving a little too fast, aren't you? Oh, That's man. too fast. Hey, this is how we do it on hey, South Side. Hey, what's up, what's up? Oh, Engine three's on scene. Engine three, guys, oh, on scene. Oh, man, no. Fire. We missed another one? Yeah, come it's on. all right. It's all right. Oh, we we need to lay, hey, guys, we'll get to lay a line God, in. Come on, get out of the way. Oh, well, it's all right. We'll lay a line come in. Come on, move. Hey, man, you, what? you're tailgating hey. the car. You're getting hey. a little too close to that. This ain't tailgating. This drafting. I'm going around and he's taking too long. Come on, move it. God, you just hit that car. Hey, hey, Skip, calm down. Robin's racing. Don't worry about it. I got it. Oh, uh, just, just, just keep it nice and slow. Keep it nice and easy. I can see it, man. It's blowing. <laughs> We're going to take this 100. We're going to take this 100. What, 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 this is it. All right, let's get some. Come on, let's go. Get ready to go. Hey, Skip, go get some. I got your back. Okay. Let's okay. go. Come on. Okay. Let's get some. Captain Montalban is now caught in a firestorm of confusion. 
Although he is skilled and competent in the art of firefighting, he has little control over the events that will soon unfold. With struggling communications and command structure, he's already behind a tidal wave of system failure. Does, uh, does that seem too far-fetched? I mean, in some way, shape, or form, have all of us been a part of something like that? My favorite part of that video is where the dogs are barking on the way to the call. Ho, 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 right? You know, what do you want me to do, right? That was me. You know, set forth expectations. You know, were you that person? You know, do you have a way of doing things? Do you have a personal, you know, standard of performance that you hold yourself to or your crew? You know, do we make sure that we establish that leadership is a two-way street? It's not, it doesn't all go one way. Because if we've got, if we establish that, that everyone leads in their own way, right? Does it absolve, not absolve, but does it, does it lighten some of the load on the people that are in those leadership positions, right? If everybody's shouldering some of the burden, is that important that we do that, that we show the people the way so that we create more leaders as we go, okay? It's important, okay? You guys doing okay sitting in your seats? Uh, because we can push through and, and be done right around lunchtime at noon if you guys are cool. Um, but we'll just keep going. I mean, come and go, come and go as you need to. What was that? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so, we talked about, you know, how important um, our role as leaders in the fire service is, right? Or our, is our, whatever. But uh, mentoring was something that was, uh, reinforced in me pretty early. And I didn't even understand, like I said, what I was looking at. And in the 49ers organization, when my dad was coaching there, um, mentoring was a big deal, where the, the veteran players were supposed to teach the rookies coming in and free agents everything that they knew about the job. So eventually, you know, those, those rookies and free agents might supplant the, the veterans as starters, okay? And a number of years ago, I received a letter from a firefighter um, who was asking me some questions, asking me for some advice on how to engage their crew, right? Because they couldn't get their tr crew to train with them. And as you know, I said earlier, our job is to make sure that we keep it magic for the people coming in, right? Is it not? Right? Make sure that there's the illusion that it is magic, right? That there is still a Santa Claus and Easter Bunny, all those things, right? And then we lead and mentor people because, like I said, you know, we learn and grow as a group by the stories that we tell, okay? And this is called a letter from the rookie. I want, I want you to see if you're following where I'm going here, okay? It goes like this. Remember how the, the rookies look at you. Captain, look, I know I'm just a rookie. I'm not experienced, that's the point. That's why I hand you to train with me, to drill with me, to make me sharp, and to help me hone my skills. I know that there is much merit and tradition, but the things that I want and need to do have merit as well. I want to learn. I'm not a two years going on 10 type of person. I look up to you. I'm a sponge. I watch your every move and I imitate what I see. 10 years from now, people know whose rookie I was by my actions, my attitude, and my work ethic. You and your crew have many combined years of service and every one of them has spent learning something. You are teaching me these things whether you know it or not or whether you want to or not. Once upon a time, you too were the eager rookie. You looked up to the veterans with awe as I do you. The firefighter you are today is a direct result of those who raised you in the fire service. In the same way, you are shaping me and my classmates, the current rookies. I will learn your habits, the way you check your gear, the apparatus, and the way that you treat me. I will be a reflection of you. I will check my SCBA the way that you taught me to, and I will show only as much attention to details you teach me to. I'm watching. Right now, I'm eager to learn. Please show me what is right. Please show me the right way to do things and instill your strong work ethic in me. Ten years from now, when people look at whose rookie I was, please let it be a good thing. Your rookie. When I got that letter, it, it really made me kind of snap back to some of the things that, that I had you know, experienced when I was growing up and how important mentoring was in the 49ers organization when I was coming up. And like I said, you know, Bill Walsh impressed upon the veterans that they were supposed to teach the new players coming in everything that they knew. And this is a picture of Freddie Solomon, who was a wide receiver on a couple of those world championship teams. And um, he was a guy who I got to know pretty well. In what proved to be Freddie's last year in the league, the Niners drafted a guy out of Mississippi Valley State, tall, skinny kid, Freddie Solomon. Yeah, that's Freddie Solomon. What's that? That's where he was born? Okay. Okay, he went to Jacksonville State, didn't he? Is that where he went? Yeah. So 
Anyway, great, great man. But the Niners drafted a kid out of Mississippi Valley State who wore number 80 for the 49ers. Anybody know who that was? Jerry Rice. You know who Jerry's mentor was? Freddie Solomon. Okay. So my experience with Freddie Solomon was um, as I'm working for, as a ball boy for a world championship organization where practices are scripted and choreographed down to the minute and excellence is expected and, and you know, uh, you're supposed to perform at a high level all the time, do you think that trickled down all the way to me as a ball boy? Think that was something that was important? Yeah, I had a, I had a schedule in my pocket that I kept where you know, I knew where I had to be for every single drill, right? And it's probably pretty important that if my job as a ball boy is to fix helmets, fix cleats, things like that, fix shoulder pads, or know how to do that, is, and during practice, retrieve the ball from the ball carrier and spot the ball for team play, is it probably pretty important that I know how to catch a football? You, you think, right? Okay. Well, when I was 12 years old and I started there, I couldn't catch a football. I was more concerned with being in the air conditioning and playing the Atari and stuff like that uh, than I was with, and I wasn't much of an athlete. Okay. There were times where someone like Joe Montana or somebody like that would whistle a football in my direction, ball would go through my hands, bounce off my face, bounce into a drill, and I would slow things down. I was a menace. There were times where actually Coach Walsh had to stop practice because I was trying to run through the middle of a drill and corral a football. Blow the whistle, stop, stop, stop. And he would say to my dad, geez, Fred, can't your kid catch a mm, football? Use an expletive before that, right? And my dad would be like, you know, my dad would work with me, right? And when, when Coach Walsh admonished me in front of the team like that, it, it, it exacted a toll on me. And I was very, very upset. And I went to my dorm and I cried. Just kidding. I didn't, I didn't even notice. Like, you can't get it. I'm like, whatever, you know. What time's lunch, right? So, um, so Freddie watched me and saw that I was kind of mucking up the works a little bit. And he said to me one day, he goes, hey, little Von Oppen, come here. We got some work to do during practice. And, and he said, hey, I, want you to, I see you holding the ball like a loaf of bread in the palm of your hand. I want you to hold it with four points of contact. Hold it against your body. Your four points of contact with the palm of your hand, your forearm, your body, and your bicep. Hold it like this. Meet me after practice. We've got some more work to do. OK. I'm like, oh, OK. I'll play your silly game. And it was 110 degrees in the afternoon there, but it was a dry heat, not like it is here. Um, right? But before practice and after practice in the heat, this professional athlete spent time with me. And he would throw me the ball over and over and over again. And he was a quarterback in college, right? But he got moved to wide receiver in the pros, right? And he would throw me the ball. And he would, he would just, just to see where I was, see what my learning level was. And, and, he was the ball would sting my hands as it hit my hands, and, and I would jam my fingers, and I'd drop the ball over and over and over again. Go, okay, stick with it. Don't quit. We'll get there. Let me show you something. When the ball comes to you above your waist, put your thumbs and your index fingers together like that. I want, to see, I want the point of the football to be in that triangle. When it comes to you below your waist, put your pinkies together like that. Okay? And for, you know, I would probably catch 100 balls before and after every practice. 400, you know, catches a day, something like that. It was crazy. He wouldn't let me quit. I didn't want to be out there. I didn't want to do it, right? But he was paying something forward to somebody who could never give it back to me. I forgot all about that stuff. Went on to play high school football. Played for a pretty good football team in high school. Got a scholarship to play, to play wide receiver at the University of Montana out of high school because I put together a really great highlight film, right? And I could catch. But in my bio for college, it says Von Oppen is a, Von Oppen. Mark, Mark is a skilled route runner and has excellent hands. What can we decipher from those two sentences, or that one sentence? I can catch. I'm an excellent route runner, and I have great hands. What does that really mean? Anybody that follows football? I can't run, right? So as a wide receiver, you've got to be able to run and catch, right? So, and run good routes. So I couldn't run, but part of my college was paid for by being able to catch a football. And I owe that to, to Freddie Solomon. Um, and like I said, my dad worked with me and stuff, but do we listen to our parents a lot of time? Nah. Okay. So none of this really, like, I had filed that away, um, you know, in my memory banks and forgotten all about it and was working in the fire service and all that. And I'd, I'd forgotten all about it until I called my dad one day and I bounced a lot of leadership ideas off my dad. And I said, hey, you know, I was asking him some questions and he, and he says to me, he goes, hey, I don't know whether you know it or not, but Freddie Solomon has cancer. And the first thing that came out of my mouth when he said that was, oh my God, he taught me how to catch a football. And um, I started thinking back to that time 
and, and kind of being reflective on you know, how I was teaching my kids and how the words that Freddie used with me, I was using with my son as he was a junior in high school playing football, learning how to catch. I would show him the way that Dwight Clark would look the ball into the catch and everything. And, and uh, some months later when I was teaching my son that stuff, I came home and, and um, after I was saying, hey, Dwight Clark taught me this, blah, 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 when we were playing catch and came home from the park with my son and my wife says, hey, Dwight Clark died today. And Freddie Solomon, some months after he was diagnosed with colon cancer, passed away about six months after I think I found out. But, you know, mentors are, are people that show up. Mentors are the voices from our past that show us which way to go. And we got to capture that, you know. We never know when mentors are going to show up, only that they will, and those times are magic. And I think back on my career when I was coming up in the fire service and, and people would, you know, corner me at the fire station and say, hey, go grab the Halligan off the rig, kid. And you'd bring it back to them and, and you would, they would say, hey, what's this end called? What's that end called? How long is it? How much does it weigh? And I thought that people were messing with me. What were they really doing maybe if I, was, if I was more receptive to it? What were they maybe trying to do? Teach me. Mentor me. Maybe try to light that spark in me to show me something that I maybe didn't know and maybe now I'm going to go back and try to find that information on my own, right? So like I said earlier, we have institutional memory. We learn and grow as a group by the stories that we tell, and mentors are incredibly important. And this is a mentoring story that comes out of Sacramento, California. And this is my friend Tilden Billiter, who's the, the lead firefighter going out, leading Truck 10 out on a commercial roof operation. There's a fire in an occupancy called the Nail Depot. And fellas, if we're talking to mostly fellas in here, uh, we hear Nail Depot, what are we thinking about in a, in a strip mall? It's a nail salon. Yeah, like a good metrosexual. You knew it was a nail salon. You'd probably get your nails done, right? OK? So, Lots of nasty chemicals. They look good, brother. Hey. See me after class. So he's sounding his way out. In Sacramento, they get some good work out there, right? So, and he's a good, savvy firefighter. I worked with him at state fire training. Um, we were part of a training group together. This guy knows what he's doing. This crew knows what they're doing, right? They're into the job. So as he's working his way out, he's thinking back to a conversation that he had with one of his mentors, a guy named Jeff Clark. Jeff was a captain at the time, and they'd had a fire sometime before this. Tilden stops by the fire station to pick Jeff's brain. Hey, man, I heard you had a fire last night. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, it was pretty bread and butter. Uh, you know, crews went interior. We went vertical vent. We're up, making our, making our cuts. We punch through. The engine company experiences a relief. We hit the hole in the right spot. They go in. They put the fire out. We're coming off the roof, and as we're getting ready to come off the roof, I'm the last one off. And as I'm getting ready to get on the ladder, I feel the roof settle and my stomach jump, kind of like I'm going over that first big dip on a roller coaster. And as I got on the ladder and got down on the ground, the roof collapsed as soon as I got boots on the ground. So if you ever have that feeling where your stomach jumps, you feel the roof settle, get off the roof as fast as you can. So they're up there working and some things aren't adding up, right? Still got big smoke coming out, but we're, you know, we're looking pretty good as the engineer comes around here, right? Thumbs up, we're good. But there's a two and a half in there and they're not winning. And as they're making their inspection cuts on the roof, they're not getting smoke coming out of the holes that they're cutting. So some things weren't adding up, right? But the decision was made to pull the interior crew out. In a commercial situation, if you've got no interior ops, what does that mean? No roof ops, right? No roof ops, no interior ops, right? So they're working up there, and again, some things aren't adding up. They got a lot of smoke production, but they're not making any progress with their inspection cuts. They had a rain roof over the existing roof that was hiding the, hiding the fire underneath it. As Tilden's bent over there on the saw, he's making his cut, he feels the roof settle and a stomach jump, and he turns to his crew and he yells, run, right here. Okay? Tilden said that his last two steps were uphill, and he could see the roof separating from the wall as he was making it to the wall. And like a good truckie, what did he not want to let go of? the chainsaw, but he said, dude, I had to increase my vertical leap. I wasn't going to make it, so I, he reluctantly chucked the saw into the fire. So he's the firefighter on the far right there um, who's going to be politely asking for a ladder to be thrown at his head and not at his feet <laughs> in just a moment. But can you imagine if that conversation had never taken place? Can you imagine? Because I can remember coming to the fire station where the station smelled like smoke, and you knew that they caught a, the other crew caught a job the night before. And I came in, and I was so arrogant. I was like, oh, I don't even want to hear what those guys have to say because they don't know what they're doing, and I'm jealous because I didn't get to go to that fire. Have we been in that mindset ever, any of us? Don't lie. Okay? Right? We're there. Okay? If we're not sharing everything that we know and love about the fire service, every trial, every tribulation, we are contributing to firefighter injuries and line of duty death. 
Do we have a problem telling the truth? Do we have a problem telling the truth? Okay, think about it. So imagine if that story had never been told, right? Are we comfortable having those hard conversations? Are we comfortable being honest with each other? Think about that, okay? So the first time I heard this story, you know, when this happened, all of our phones went off, right? Because he was a part of this training group. Hey, Tilden was in a roof collapse, more to follow. Okay, and there's a big article in fire engineering about this. The Sacramento Fire Department was very forthcoming about it. All the mistakes that they made, they put it out there, right? But when I heard the story firsthand from Tilden when I saw him again down at a bar in San Diego when we were drinking beers, when we were in the firehouse world together, he said, the only reason why I'm alive today is because of a conversation I had with Jeff Clark. And it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Okay, because I know Jeff, right? So think about it. Everybody is a mentor. If you've been on the job one day longer than somebody else, when you come on the job, if you know how to make the coffee, tell the other rookie how to make the coffee. Tell the things that, that you learned to keep them out of trouble, okay? All right, so the main tool I wanted you to walk away from this conversation with today um, is the 10 for you, 10 for me. And when I put this slide up here and I say culture is deliberate, what does that mean? Don't leave, brother, we're almost done. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> so did I. That's why I started the video. <laughs> so um, when I say culture is deliberate, what do I mean by that? What do we mean by that? We create it. Is it something that we choose? Do we have a say in it? Yeah. OK. And does it happen overnight? All right, another one. I'll put another one. Does it happen overnight? No. But when people look at the, from the outside and look at your organization, if your organization's functioning at a high level, you know, for the longest time, it was the Phoenix Fire Department, right? They're the gold standard of what you know, the fire service should look like and what should be re represented in the fire service. No? Right? Do you think that those changes, all the stuff that they did in the Phoenix Fire Department happened overnight? No. Culture is deliberate. It's something you have to work at. Quick change happens slowly. You know, the newest fire department that I think is out there where everybody's kind of looking at them as visionaries and, and all things good in the fire service is probably the colony in Texas. If you're, you know, what's going on, is it Scott Thompson? He's the chief there, wrote the book. Um, I, I can't remember the name of his book. It's terrible that I can't remember it. But um, great guy. They're doing some great things there. But do you think that that happened? Do you think they just flicked a switch and it just, it just happened? No. We have to set our mind about doing it, right? And the people who make a difference are the ones who say what they're going to do, and then they actually do it. Excellence is my responsibility? OK. How do we do that? You know, do we set about doing it? Do we, lay, do we set forth expectations? And do we put it out there? And if we're doing so, you know, this is, we're trying to create that grassroots belief. And in our organization, this is how we articulated it. And where this came from was from when my dad was coaching for the 49ers. They had a sign in the locker room that said, I will not be out hit at any point this season. And all the players signed their name and their jersey number to it as a way of showing what? Accountability. Ownership, right? They're basically synonymous, are they not? Where do we go wrong with accountability? If accountability is synonymous with ownership, that's a good thing, right? But a lot of times when we're trying to change a culture, do you hear people come in and say when they're in leadership roles that they've just stepped into, we need to start holding people accountable? Do you hear people doing that? When we talk about accountability in that sense, what are we looking at? Punishment, right? Is accountability a discipline or is accountability disciplinary? I think if we're doing accountability right, accountability is the discipline to have the expectation talk, care enough about each other, right, to hold each other accountable, right? Set those expectations on the front end, right, and say this is how we do things around here, hold each other accountable to it, and as a company officer in my fire station, in my firehouse, do I have to be just as accountable to this standard, do your job, treat people right, give all that effort, have an all-in attitude? Do I have to be just as accountable as I expect my firefighters to be? Absolutely, because if I'm not doing the things, the things that I say we're going to do, it all falls apart. So we created this sign, right, and we put it up. I brought it to the fire station. I said, this is where I'd like us to go. We're going to go here together. And I'm equally as responsible. I have just as much stake in this thing as you do. I'm going to hold you accountable to this standard because I'm your company officer. I want you to come along with me. And along with that, 
I need you to hold me accountable to the standard as well when I start to drift. Because am I human? Yeah. Am I a robot? I mean, I, am I like, am I going to be that person all the time? Is it hard to be that person all the time? Okay, excellence is my responsibility. We're trying to reach the summit. We're trying to stay at the top of our, of our game all the time, right? Perfection is the summit. Is it possible to reach perfection? Nope, right? But hopefully, like Vince Lombardi said, when we're pursuing excellence, it gets us that much closer to perfection, right? We're chasing perfection, and hopefully in the pursuit of perfection, we achieve excellence. Excellence is my responsibility in the big four. That's our base camp. That's our reset. That's what we remind ourselves of so we can remain around the summit. Because trying to be at the top of your game all the time is exhausting, is it not? Okay. So I brought this in and I said, hey, I'm going to sign my name and my badge number to it as a way of showing that I'm accountable to you. I want you to come along with me. And all of my guys signed it. I didn't order them to do it. They did it willingly. So here's a Sharpie. If you guys want to come on board with me, if you want to do this, sign it. These are all the things that I saw them doing anyway. They were very special people, okay? Very motivated, and they inspired me, like I said. The people that I work with are where I draw a lot of my inspiration, okay? Come in here, I draw inspiration from you as well, okay? And the more that we put it on the wall, and this was our way of articulating it, right? This wasn't necessarily the organization's way, but it dovetailed in with what we were doing as an organization. It flowed right along with our organizational core values, right? But this was just how we articulated it at Fire Station 2 where I was the new captain. Signed it, and, and, and as, as, as word started to get out about what we were doing in the culture that we were creating at our fire station, people started asking, hey, what's that sign that you have at your fire station? Where'd that come from? What is that? Well, that came from us. That came from our hearts. This is, this is how we articulate it, right? And again, we're trying to be those people. We're not going to get there every single day, but this is how we remind ourselves of it. And they said, can we come over and can we sign the board as well? Absolutely. Okay. And it started to grow from there to the point where, you know, now through social media and all this other stuff, um, it's grown to a point where um, it, it's, it's certainly national and international. So the main tool that I want you to take away from this conversation today is the 10 for you, 10 for me leadership pact. And this is a way, this is the skeleton of how we're going to start the conversation with our people. Okay. In the void that's created sometimes, you know, by our lack of communication, this is a tool that you can use right, to start the conversation with your people, okay? And where this came from, um, the 10 for you, 10 for me, came from my, my dad from 40 years of coaching. And um, it would stand to reason that because I live and work in the San Francisco Bay Area where my dad spent, you know, three separate tours of duty at, at Stanford University and worked for the San Francisco 49ers, it would make sense that some of the players that my dad coached during that time might still reside in the Bay Area, and they do. And sometimes, you know, they'll look about the same as they did, maybe a little bit older, maybe a little bit grayer, and I'll come walking up to them sometimes when I'm in uniform or I see them at the grocery store or something like that or around town, I'll say, hey, aren't you so-and-so? And they'll say, yeah, uh, I am. I'll say, hey, well, I'm, I'm Mark Von Oppen. Oh, you're Fred Von Oppen's kid. I remember you, you were kind of short and fat and couldn't catch a football, you'd still practice down that one? I'm a captain now, though, right? But, <laughs> like, so? so um, but, you know, it, it doesn't go like that. But like, hey, you know, they're always really nice. And, and to a person, they'll say, man, you know, your dad is one of the greatest guys I ever played for. And after a while, you know, at first you think those are just kind of platitudes, right? But after a while, it starts to resonate with you, where it's like, okay, maybe there is something to it. So I called up my dad, and I said, hey, what gives? Why is it that when I run into these guys, they say that you're one of the greatest guys that they ever played for? And I saw, he, he says, I don't know whether that's true or not. But, you know, he blah, 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 all these different things that he was saying. He finally said, I used to have this 10 for you, 10 for me leadership contract, da, 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 da. And I, he, then they went right on to something else. And I went, er, hold on, rewind that. I go, what was that? And he goes, 10 for you, 10 for leader, me leadership contract. It's a way of holding each other accountable. It's, it's, this is what I give to you as your coach, and this is what I expect from you as a player. I'm going to hold you to the standard, because that's my job as a coach. But if I'm not living up to who I said I would be, who I give to you, you know, as a coach, who I said I'd always be, we're supposed to talk about it. And doesn't it work better that way when it's a two-way street, when you say, hey, here's what I give to you, in exchange, here's what I need from you, right? Come along with me on this journey. I'm not, what do, what do our firefighters do? And maybe some of you will remember this if you're new to leadership positions. If you walk in, what's your firefighter going to do if you walk in and you say, hey, Mark's here, I'm the captain, pop my collar, and I say, here are the 10 things that I expect from you, and if I don't get these 10 things, I'm going to be pissed. 
What are our firefighters going to do? They'll laugh. Yeah. This thing might end up in the circular file, right? Okay. But are they going to, isn't it going to be a whole lot better if I say, hey, here's what I'm going to give to you as a company officer, and this is what I expect from you in return. We're going to do this together. Let's sit down and talk about this stuff. Okay. So I said, hey, send me that stuff. I need to check it out. Okay. And what this does is this puts everybody on the same page. And is that important? Because people like to know what's expected of them, right? So this is what 10 for the officer looks like. Okay. And all of these things, you know, I said, hey, send that to me. I said, email it to me. And my dad says, I don't do that email stuff. I'm 75 years old. I don't do that. All right? And I said, well, then send it to me snail mail. He sent it to me snail mail. And like three months later, it showed up. But he had it all written out in his elegant penmanship, right? And I, as I started looking at it, I said, these are all the things that you used to chase us around the house saying when I was a kid. I said, that stuff works with adults. Uh, feel free to take any pictures you want. And um, I'll put my contact information. I'll give it to Ashley as well. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, but, you know, consistency, sense of urgency, all these things, never satisfied. What, I, what he would do is he would sit down with each one of his players and say, you know, what do these things mean to you? And here's what they mean to me. And he would, this is how they started the conversation, right? Because I hate to break it to you guys, because it's mostly guys in this room, but what is probably the one thing that we're the worst at as, as humans? As the, as the male of the species, what's the one thing we're really bad at? Communication. Yeah. What drives us craziest about like our wives and girlfriends and things like that? What do they always want to do when there's a problem? Talk. Yeah, talk, right? They want to talk, right? Talk, 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 talk. Well, that's called communication, right? And we may not like it, but one way or the other, there's some sort of a resolution, right? And how does it always end? Right. I get the last word in every argument with my wife by saying, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. That's how I get the last word in every single time. But why is consistency so important for the company officer? Why is consistency something that we should strive for as people in leadership roles? People know what to expect? Know where you stand, right? You trust him? Yeah. Yeah. So like if I step out of line as a company officer, is it fair that my crew calls me out? Like if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, right? Okay. I try to be the same person every single day when I report to work. Okay. Consistency is incredibly important, and that's why it's number one. Okay. What about sense of urgency? What does that look like from us as leadership, le people in leadership roles? Get on the truck? Yeah. It's the only reason why we exist is to answer the bell. What does IFSA say the two main priorities are throughout the day? The two main priorities, okay? Emergency response, preparation for emergency response. Okay, I'm gonna have that sense of urgency. When, when the tones drop, I expect us to get to the rig yesterday, okay? And along with sense of urgency in terms of re responding on calls, that's kind of a no-brainer for me. That's what I expect, right? I don't want you shoveling in 10 more bites of food and huffing and puffing when we get a call. Okay, I'm gonna be the first one up and out the door when we get a call, right? And also, when you come to me with a problem, I'm gonna make that problem my problem. Write it down. You know, give it my just, you know, my just attention, right? Listen to what you have to say to make sure that they understand that I value, you know, what they value, right? Are our people's problems our problems? Yeah, okay? So get back to them in a timely manner. Give it that sense of urgency, okay? Never satisfied, okay? I don't get paid to be satisfied with performance of the crew. That's not my job, okay? My job is to, to maximize our performance so we can be at the top of our game all the time, and you can expect from me, I will acknowledge, we will talk about what we did well, and there's going to be something to learn from every single incident we go on, every training that we go on. Is that fair? And if we establish that ahead of time, does that eliminate a lot of the hard feelings? People sometimes say, well, I can't please my company officer. They're never happy. Well, if we know that up, up front, people will start expecting that. They want to hear it from you. They want that constructive criticism. They want that coaching. And somewhere along the line, the older we get, we lose the ability to be coached. I certainly have. Okay? You want to see me get my feelings hurt, you know, ask me what I did at a fire. Why would you do that? Well, I, this is what I, you know what I mean? It's like we get defensive, right? So we have to make sure that we're honest self-evaluators, too, so that if someone comes to us with a concern, we, we listen to it. Leadership and direction, you didn't expect me to know the way, go the way, show the way. If I'm not setting the example, okay, if I'm not living up to who I said I'd be, 
or who we expect us to be as leaders, I can't expect you to do it either. Okay, it's a two-way street. And again, the people who make a difference are the ones who say what they're gonna do and then they actually do it. Forthrightness, I'm gonna tell you what you need to hear. You may not wanna hear it, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. And then we're gonna move on from it. It's gonna be a learning opportunity. Same for me. If there's something that I fell short on and you come to me and you tell me, hey, I needed more of this or less of that, we sit and talk about it, you can come to me and we're gonna talk about that and you can do that with, without fear of retribution. Okay, open dialogue, right? That's the next one. Same type of thing, right? Open doors have to equal open minds. I have to be open-minded when people come to me. I can't be closed-minded, okay? And a lot of times, sometimes pride gets in the way, ego gets in the way, and it, it stops the communication, okay? Accountability, Leadership 101 says what? When things are going well, who do we celebrate? Who gets the credit for that? The crew, right? When things aren't going well, what am I supposed to do as a company officer? Do what? Take it? No. I push the crew out in front and go, look what I'm dealing with. Are you kidding me right now? I gotta work with these people? This is why I can't be successful. I'm kidding. So, when things are going well, hey, chief, the reason why you performed such a high level today is because of the people that we're working with here. I got great people, right? And when things aren't going well, you put the people behind you and you own that stuff, right? Okay, so that's leadership 101. Technical command, you can trust me to be technically and tactically proficient. That's my job. Never be satisfied with my learning level, okay? Always be a constant student of the game. Okay, and that, that definition for technical command, you know, having a good mastery of the game comes straight from the book Small Unit Leadership. Has anybody read it? Excellent book, is it not? Yeah. And why is it perfect for firefighters? Do you know? Right. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's outstanding. It's a great book. Um, and his, his you know, reason for, for using the book is much better than mine. I was just going to say that it's, it, it's small, it's short, and it has big print and lots of pictures. <laughs> but he was more spot on, right? But it's perfect for firefighters because it does talk about you know, leading small groups. And, and oftentimes, we're leading small groups. Are we not engine companies, truck companies, stuff like that, right? So it talks about you know, putting your people first, things like that, some of the stuff that's kind of lost, right? Sometimes, and if we're not honest about why we promote, Sometimes we promote for the wrong reasons, but thank you. That's, that's the real reason why the book's good. Mine was just kind of a, a lazy person's reason. But um, respect. Make sure that we're, we're showing respect to the crew, right? And there's little ways that we can do that, right? Um, we have to be respectful of the crew's time. I try to be respectful of the crew's time. I try to be respectful of the things that they're trying to learn, right? Is it important during the day that if, if we're a morning meeting type of a department that we sit down and say, hey, what do you want to accomplish today? Make sure that the crew gets their meals on time, things like that, and try to meet those, those benchmarks, okay? And then try to have a sense of humor, right? Um, I try not to take myself too seriously, especially in a leadership role, because you know, there's times where absolutely you gotta be in charge, and there's times where everybody knows that you're in charge, right? But it's exhausting to try to be that person that is on all the time. Furthermore, do we like to cut people down and have fun with people that take themselves too seriously? Right? There's nothing that firefighters like better than, than bringing you down a couple notches when you think that you, you're the, you know, whatever. Right? So <laughs> think about that. Okay? You know, don't be the class clown, but don't take yourself too seriously. Especially when there's like a new drill or something that's going on and new training going on. Be one of the first ones to step up and, and, and you know, make yourself maybe look silly because it's a new skill and you've never done it before. Okay? But don't take yourself too seriously. Okay? Um, it makes you human. Okay? What to expect, what I expect from your firefighters, what I expect from you, okay? You'll see a lot of these things are repeated. So what's true for the company officer is true for the firefighter. Sense of urgency, okay? Be here now, be present, okay? You'll hear that a couple of different times. It goes along with concentration as well. Get on the truck, get going, okay? The only reason why we exist is to answer the bell. Concentration, okay? We work a 4896 work shift, and because of the injuries and, and the short staffing that we have right now, most of us in my department are working a 96 48, because we never get to go home, okay? Do I expect that my firefighters should be plugged in and 100% laser focused for 48 or 96 or 120 hours? Do I expect that? No, okay, but there are times where I need you to be that way, and when I need you to be that way, I need you to be there. Training 
And emergency response is, okay, I need you to be laser focused. Eyes and ears, when we start to drift, I'm gonna let you know. Hey, give me your eyes and ears, let's go. Plug in, okay? Um, full compliance. I don't write the rules, but my job as a company officer is to enforce them. And I trust that we're all adults and that we're gonna do the right thing. Our department has general orders. Read them, know them. Don't make me be the company officer because when I step in, it, you're not gonna like it, right? And is that fair? Okay, I'm gonna look at it, you know, as a training opportunity. If, if, if something happens and we, we veer off course, okay, I failed you as a company officer, but it becomes habitual. If you're a habitual line stepper, we got a problem, okay? So, and is that fair? Okay, I think so. Okay, will to prepare, we can never lose that will to prepare. Never lose that sense of urgency, okay? Why do we show up early for shift to check out the truck so we're ready? Why do we work out so we're ready? Why do we eat right so we're ready? Why do we take classes? Why do we come to fire school? All that stuff, we do that so that we're ready. We can never lose that will to prepare. When we're through learning, we're through, okay? Um, accountability, being ready to be that next person up, okay? Is it important that we learn the jobs of the people around us? Absolutely, okay? Know the jobs of the people around you, be willing to you know, pull your weight, know what you're supposed to do, know where you fit into the evolution so that you're contributing to the su success of the evolution, not the failure of it, okay? Um, and I think about you know, like the vicarious experience that we need sometimes in training. You know, I think about you know, the backup quarterback when I was watching football practice when I was a kid. One of my jobs after I learned how to catch a football as I got older is I would step into the huddle during practice and we had a dry erase board that I would write the play on and I would hold, I would write down, you know, 22Z in, right? And I'd hold it up, it'd have the formation and the, the, the call and all that stuff, and I would hold it up so the rest of the offensive players who were not in, you know, you know, on the field at the time could see what the call was and they could have that vicarious experience that they were plugged in. Okay, be accountable even in training, okay? Know what's going on, know what the audibles are, know what, you know, know the, the different courses of action you might have to take based upon how things are going. Okay, but be accountable to your brothers and sisters. Know the jobs of the people around you. Commitment, there's only two forms of it. You're either in or you're out. And I can tell pretty easily whether you're in or you're out, right? And if you've got someone that's a very motivated person and they start to seem like they're falling off the, off the wagon a little bit in terms of their motivation, do we have an obligation to step in and talk to them and say, hey, what's going on? Make sure that everything's okay, okay? Has anybody read the book, Hits Your Ship? Okay, yeah? How did, um, is, it, is it Michael Abershoff, the, the captain of the Benfold? Can you just paraphrase for me how Captain Abershoff turned the Benfold around from being one of the lowest missile destroyers in the, in the Navy to one of the top performers in a very short time frame? Can you? Yeah, he created trust and accountability by getting to know his crew. He sat down with every member of the crew, knew them by their first name, knew what their specialties were, knew if they were married, knew if they had kids, all that stuff, right? And, and said, based upon a certain set of parameters, I can, I'm gonna trust you to make decisions. If it goes beyond this, it needs to come to me. But he created you know, a system of accountability where people felt empowered to do their jobs, and he trusted them to do their jobs, right? And if basically it was, if no one was gonna die, equipment wasn't gonna get ruined, it wasn't gonna cost the Navy a ton of money, you had autonomy to make a lot of decisions, basically, right? Great book, great leadership book. If you, It's called It's Your Ship. Um, so uh, commitment, right? Uh, willingness to play a role. Does everybody get to do the hot job? Or are things like going and doing public safety inspections, are those a big deal? Home safety inspections, right? Doing smoke alarms, all that stuff in people's homes, is that sexy stuff? but is it something that we gotta do, right? Okay, right. Does everybody get to do the hot job? Does everybody get to be on that nozzle, doing that search, you know, going in, attacking the fire, doing all that stuff? No, is the person driving the water tender just as important as that person on the nozzle? Yep, hitting the hydrant, pump panel, you know, shagging a hose on that dark corner, right? That dark hot corner inside, right? Okay, you pull any of those people out of the equation and the whole thing could fall apart. So impress upon the people that you have to be willing to play your role, do your job, do it well, okay? Because other people are counting on you to do it. Officers lead, you follow. You can trust me to make the right decision based on my knowledge, skills, and abilities, okay? My sense of urgency in terms of learning, my never satisfied mentality, right? Of, of constantly trying to learn and constantly trying to better myself, okay? 
you can trust me to make the right decision. However, it is not blind faith in me as a leader. Are there times where I need people to speak up? Absolutely. We all know what those times are, right? Safety issue comes up that I might be blind to. Why am I blind to it? Because like we talked about, when my heart rate, my blood pressure get up above a certain point, my vision narrows, my hearing goes away, and we can test this because in a training situation or on a fire scene or an emergency, whatever it is, how many times has a firefighter come up and tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, Cap, or hey, Lieutenant, they're trying to get you on the radio? Yeah. What? And it's a low-level incident because you're so task-saturated doing what you're doing, you even lose your ability to hear. You can't even process the radio traffic, okay? So I need your help sometime, okay? Most of the time, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're going to be taking the right course of action. But if you see something that seems really weird to you, talk to me. Okay? Um, finish. Okay? See things through to completion. Make sure that we're completing things and, and, and seeing things through. Right? How many times do we have half-completed tasks around the fire station based upon how um, distracted a lot of us are? We're short-staffed for this, for that. But, I mean, do devices make things very difficult for people to get things done around the fire station? <laughs> right? I mean, it's like you can, you can kind of see where some people have been sometimes, where like cabinets are open and you know, all that stuff. So see things through. Make sure that you're, you're, you're finishing things off and, and doing what you said you were going to do, because right? that makes a difference. And then we talk about the standard of performance, right? And how we're going to, how we're going to bring this all together. And the four things that, that we use in our fire station as, as the reset for us is you know, do your job like a professional. Do your job. Treat people right. Give all that effort. Have an all-in attitude. Those are the four things that we use to govern ourselves um, when we start to drift, okay? And that's the 10 for you, 10 for me. That's the main thing I wanted you guys to walk away from this with today. Um, it's been very successful for me. What this really allows me to do is tailor my coaching and my leadership style to the individual. And this, doesn't, this isn't just for the fire service. I mean, this can be for any industry, whatever you're in. And it doesn't have to be the 10 for you, 10 for me. But this allows me to, to allow me to speak to the individual so that even in a group setting, they feel like I'm speaking to them individually. Right? And I hear certain things that you know, are important to them. It's important my company officer has my back. Well, what does that mean? Okay? My kids' names are this. You know, I, this is what's important to me, all these things. So I can really understand what makes that person tick and really try to get the best out of them in a team setting. Get the best out of that individual so they can function in that team setting. And that's what we're looking for. Okay, questions about the 10 for you, 10 for me. You guys tired of me yelling at you yet? Okay, um, about five more minutes. So what we're gonna do here right now is we're gonna watch one more video. And we talked a lot about, you know, some of the complacency as it pertains to communication. Um, being lazy in terms of not even wanting to tell people what to do. And it doesn't mean that, that they were bad people, it's just that they didn't see the importance of of you know, the leadership opportunity that they had when I was younger, right? But, and we talked about some of what it looked like when I was you know, a young firefighter and how not knowing what my role was, how it could have contributed to a bad outcome possibly um, and what the consequences are of that. We talked about setting forth expectations. So when training and expectations meet, we're gonna watch a video about you know, what that really looks like. And, and when, when we're doing things the right way, um, this is what it looks like, and this is what it sounds like, okay? So this is another video out of Sacramento, California, um, where I'll set the stage for you. There's, there's a full assignment going to a um, reported smoke inside of a fully sprinklered building. New construction. So how excited are we when we hear fully sprinklered building, we know the building, it's new construction, and it's an automatic fire alarm? How excited are we for that? I mean, are we like, yeah, no, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna see wildly varying levels of engagement? Different levels of PPE? Different levels of giving a shit, right? Okay, so that's what it's good, right? I said it, okay, um, right? But as the battalion chief arrives on scene of this reported smoke inside a building, automatic fire alarm, as the full assignment's in route code three, a call comes in for a structure fire across the street from this automatic fire alarm with a, with a person trapped. And I want you to watch this video and tell me if you don't think that this battalion chief knew what his crews are capable of down to a person well in advance of this incident, okay? So we'll watch it and we'll talk about it real quick. Second 
Copy. Let's go ahead and divert everybody from the uh, Goodwill fire to the apartment fire and uh, backfill that Goodwill fire. Nine sevens on 07 for roll call Del Camino. We're going to suspend roll call. We've got a working fire with the victim trapped. Nine sevens assuming El Camino command. It's going to be a two-story garden-style apartment complex. Command post is located across the street on the A side. It's going to be an offensive strategy repeating potential victim trapped in apartment 4-5. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see it. I guess you can, but... You'll see Dad coming down the breezeway here, interfacing with the truck captain. It's going to be Camino and uh, Drayton. Saying, my son's trapped in the upstairs Camino, just apartment. just the morse. There's a fire in the kitchen. I can't get out of there. So that's going on right now. Open mic on Fire. 101, get that water supply, and you're going to be fire attack group. You're going to have engine 106 working for you. Copy, truck 106, you are all in. You're uh, initiating rescue. I'm going to put a group supervisor behind you as soon as I get one. Medic 30, you're going to assume medical group standby for a potential victim. Watch you on the uh, A side by truck 106. How's our sense of urgency? One ten upon your arrival, you're going to assume rescue group. You've got truck 106 working for you. We've got a confirmed rescue. You've got truck 106 working for you, your rescue group. Hazmat command, what's your ETA? Truck 106 command. Are you able to possibly split and give me vertical ventilation if we need it? Copy that. Upon your arrival, you'll be vet group. I'm going to make you roof division shine. Uh, objectives vertical vent all out. Yeah, Rescue 20, if you're on scene now, why don't you go all out to the roof, put you on uh, vertical ventilation. Engine 19, report to fire attack group. That's going to be engine 101. Find out what he needs in the way of additional lines. One zero five, come up with your gear and your crew uh, to the command post, ASAP. Same assignment as uh, 105. Come to the command post ASAP, fully equipped, ready to go with tools and SCBA. Uh, command medic 110's on scene. Medic 110, come to the command post with Gurney and Gear. You're reporting to a medical group who's going to be uh, the medic already on scene at the command post. It's going to be medic 30, I believe. Copy, Hazmat. You've got Rescue 20 working for you. They're going to the roof now. Why don't you assist them with vertical vent? If uh, you don't need both companies to the roof, then check out that positive pressure for me. Just want to make sure we get this opened up. Fire, 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 fire. Fire, fire, fire. 
We got a victim right there now, right there. In fact, we got the victim on the uh, command post side. How do you think that went? Okay. Do you think that happened just because they decided they were going to show up one day and be great? Remember what I said, culture is deliberate, right? People who make the changes are the ones who say what they're going to do, and they actually do it. Okay? That incident, the success of that incident was set in motion some years before this, where if you talk to Anthony Castros, who's the battalion chief on that call, um, we're on that incident, and he teaches command. He teaches, he's written a number of books. Um, he's an excellent instructor, great man, uh, great, great fire, uh, lead, fire service leader. Um, some years before this, in his battalion, they had a fire in a similar building that didn't go that way. Where he said he got task saturated, company officers got task saturated, and they lost three civilians. Because they didn't feel like they were ready. So they set about training, learning, setting forth expectations over and over and over again, running that scenario so that if they ever were presented with it again, they wouldn't make the same mistakes that they had made the years before that. They got a shot at redemption, and that's how it went. Okay? It didn't happen by accident. We have to set forth the expectations, work towards that goal. Culture is deliberate, okay? And when training and expectations meet, you know, we have those lofty standards, right? Well, you can see that, but that's, that's Jeremy, that lifeless kid that was pulled from the fire. He survived with only second degree burns to the backs of his legs when the, the crew did a VEIS operation and pulled him out over the windowsill. The windowsill was, was hot and he got second degree burns on the backs of his legs. But after he came out of a medically induced coma, that's him with elements of engine 101, truck 106, and Anthony Castro, who's in the upper left hand corner. Culture is deliberate. We have a say in it, okay? And I hope that when our time comes and we're presented with that, that we've trained and we've prepared and we've set forth expectations so that we can live up to who we said we'd always be, okay? And I'm gonna leave you with this, okay? And I thank you for your time, but this is a letter I wrote to myself some years ago uh, so that when I start to drift, this is who I try to remind myself to be. This is called measure, and it goes like this. There's a difference you can find in those people who stand apart from the crowd, those people of character who just seem to get it. The intangible quality that sets them apart is something completely tangible. It's called a work ethic, and it's the oft forgotten element on the journey to building or rebuilding a culture. You can feel it when you touch a book, when you pick up a tool, or when you wipe your brow when it's slick from sweat. Too many times we give accolades for simply showing up, keeping a seat warm, or holding down a spot. Accommodations are handed out like participation ribbons. We talk about change, talk about improved performance, but we go no further. Changes are made by those who take action. Activity should never be confused with achievement, and just because you exist, it doesn't mean you deserve. The privilege of wearing the uniform and the gift of service is something that's earned, it's not a right. Ask yourself, who's in there? Do you remember what it took to get to where you are today? Do you remember the promises that you made? Do you remember who you said you'd always be? Find that person again. Remember how you used to measure yourself. The uniform doesn't give you power or credibility, your actions do. Wearing tights and a cape doesn't mean that you've earned the right to be called a superhero. You are what you repeatedly do. If you believe that excellence is your responsibility and you strive for it day in and day out, then that's where you'll go. If you bellyache and talk about change, but are unable or unwilling to make the change in yourself, then you'll stand still. Excellence isn't, isn't easily achieved in the same way neither is confidence. Confidence is, hard, confidence is hard won and fleeting. We are perceived to be larger than life creations that defy natural laws and are the very image of all that is right. The fact is, we're human. We're full of faults, shortcomings, and insecurities. To overcome these, we must be tire tireless in the pursuit of our ideals. The importance of holding one another accountable cannot be overstated. Accountability is a discipline. We do it for the person next to us. We do it for each other. We do it on our own together. I want to do what I'm meant to do. I want to do it with passion. I want to do what makes people feel. When my career's over, I want to be remembered for the things that can't be measured. I want to look back and say I did my job. When everything else has faded away, nobody's going to remember the metrics. They'll remember the person inside the uniform. If you're not living up to who you said you'd always be, 
It'll just be at a costume party for 30 years and you'll quickly be forgotten. If that's what you choose, you can walk away from your career with only your certificate of attendance. I'm not going out like that. I want to thank you for your time. Um, it's been humbling to be here. Um, I appreciate the hospitality. I appreciate you trusting me enough to come here to talk to you. Make sure that when you get to the end of your career, this isn't what they give you. Okay. My name is Mark Von Oppen. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, fun. Thank you.